What's up everybody? It's Travis here from Travis.media and today we're going to be talking about Kubernetes. What is Kubernetes? And I'm going to give you some practical examples. Why it's important, should you learn it, and what's the best path to take to learn Kubernetes in 2020. Let's get started. All right, so before we get started, as always, if you're into coding, web development, DevOps, conquering life in general, consider hitting that subscribe button below. Lots of great videos are planned for 2020. So before we talk about what Kubernetes is, let me just make a note on whether you should even be learning it or not. So if you are a freelancer, let's say you work like WordPress or like Joomla, some CMS, and your client base is like local businesses, small to medium sized businesses that are not really looking to scale, or if Docker or containers are not on your day to day radar at all, then learning Kubernetes may not be important for you. There are probably more important things to learn at this time. You can't learn everything. So if you're in that category, then it's probably not a priority to learn Kubernetes. However, if you work for a company, some software company, and you have medium to large size clients, or if you work with containers or are planning to work with containers at all, you should learn Kubernetes right away. Let me give you some quick statistics to back that up. And this is from the Cloud Native Computing Foundation's website. All right, listen to this. 84% of companies are using containers in production this year, okay? 84% of companies are using containers in production this year. 78% of these companies are using Kubernetes to manage those containers, okay? 78%. That's some pretty good incentive to learn Kubernetes, in my opinion. Another interesting statistic was this. There are 109 tools out there to manage containers. And 89% of these 109 tools are using various Kubernetes versions. So that's why I think it's important to learn Kubernetes in 2020. Now, this is assuming that you have an understanding of containers and something like Docker. If not, I created a video a couple of weeks ago. It's about an hour long. Go make yourself some coffee, kick back, turn on your computer, and I can teach you Docker in one hour. I'll link to that video above. Check that out first and then come back to this video if you're not familiar with containers or some kind of runtime like Docker. So this is a graph that I found recently on the uh, Weaveworks website. And basically this shows you that Kubernetes is leading the pack. This is from 2014 through 2018. Now, that's a pretty big climb compared to something like Docker Swarm or Mesos or whatever that is. I've never heard of it. But uh, Docker Swarm, I know some people use that, but Kubernetes is growing. All right, so what is Kubernetes? So when I first started looking into this, it didn't make any sense to me. I was brand new to containers. I wasn't working on Kubernetes at work, and I was just like, this, this thing is mysterious. I cannot wrap my head around it. What's the use of it? Do I really need to know it? Well, let me give you a kind of a non-technical, broad overview of what Kubernetes is. I use it regularly, every day at work now, and I think I'm at a point where I can make it easy for you to understand. Kubernetes is an open source orchestration slash automation system for managing containers. Now that's a mouthful, what does that even mean? So imagine this, you have your application, you containerize it, you're gonna use something like Docker, right? And so you spin up a server and you install Docker on there and you pull your image and build it and now your application is running on a server somewhere, you give it an IP address or a DNS or something like that, your application's running, great. You got your application running in a container. It's not really a lot of benefit there, you see. The point of containers is, is to be able to spin them up, spin them down, pass them along to other people easily, okay? It's not like a virtual machine where you gotta boot it up, you gotta wait for things to happen, you got lots of resources being used. It's just a container. It'll start in milliseconds. So just to put one of those on a server somewhere and run your application, it's kind of pointless. Also, what happens if it crashes? You got to SSH into it, log into it, and run it again? What if you want to scale it? What if you want to add a second one? Well, then you got to worry about load balancing. What about high availability? So the container itself, I mean, what do you do with it? You need some kind of system. You want to automate stuff. You want to orchestrate your containers in some sort of way. So Kubernetes makes it easy to automate and manage that whole scenario. So you can define your container, you can tell it how many copies you want, whether you want a load balancer, you can automate 
the deployment of it, when one dies, you can have a new one spin up. You can say, hey, I need five more instances because Tiger Woods is leading the Masters on a Sunday. So it's this entire system that allows you to orchestrate and automate containers in production. Now let me see if I can help out a little more with the diagram. Okay, here's a diagram I found also on the Weaveworks website. I think it's really helpful. It's a very it's a diagram of a very basic Kubernetes cluster. And I just wanna give you a broad overview of it. So you have this master node and you have two worker nodes. So with Kubernetes, you have a master node and then you can have a handful of worker nodes. In this case, we have two, you might have 10, you might have 15, whatever. In this master node, you have the system components. And in the worker nodes are where your applications are gonna live. Now, when you interact with Kubernetes, you do so via API requests. You talk to this API server here. You say, hey, post this, get this, update this, whatever. But most people talk to it through a CLI called Cube CTL or Cube Control or Cube Cuddle, whatever you want to call it. It's a CLI that makes it really easy to interact with the Kubernetes API. So you make your request there. And there's other system components here. There's more than this, but they give a controller manager, which handles things like replication, namespaces, service accounts. There's a scheduler. So when you deploy your application, say you deploy like three copies of it, the scheduler is going to look at the worker nodes and decide the best place to put your applications. That's the scheduler. There's other things that go on in there, but the concept I want you to get here is that the master node is going to house your system components and they're going to send along updates to your applications or new applications or whatever you want them to do. So there's a master node and there's worker nodes. Also in Kubernetes, containers live inside of pods. So most of the time, you're just gonna have one container per pod. You can have multiple per pod, whatever you wanna do, but you're gonna deploy these pods. And on the worker nodes, there's a Docker runtime environment. Uh, there's this kubelet that plays a pretty important role. And there's other things like services. You can expose your pods to the public facing internet. All of that stuff I don't wanna get into in this drawing. The main thing I want you to get is that there's a master node there's an API server that you talk to, and there's worker nodes that house your applications. So enough of this diagram, let's look at this practically. Now, if you wanna experiment with this on your local computer, there's an application called Minikube. Basically, Minikube is a very small Kubernetes cluster on your local computer. However, it's only a master node. You don't get any worker nodes. It's only a master node, so your system components are gonna live there as well as your applications. But it's a very helpful application for getting practice with Kubernetes. There's also some other places you can practice at I'm gonna tell you about later in this video. So now I want to move to a practical example of me deploying an application onto Kubernetes via Minikube. So again, Minikube is something you can install locally on your computer. It's a one node Kubernetes cluster for your local computer. And if you need any help installing or you need a Minikube tutorial, you want to know how to install kubectl, anything like that that you want me to go further into, let me know down in the comments and I'll do a follow-up video. But for now, I'm just going to keep moving. So most of the time with Kubernetes, people create these YAML files. And in the YAML file, they declare how they want the state of their application to be in Kubernetes. So they say, hey, I want my application, my state to look like this at all times. And it's Kubernetes job to keep up with that and make sure that your state is maintained at all times. So with this YAML file, I'm gonna declare, hey, I wanna create a kind of deployment. I want uh, three copies of my application. Down here in containers, you'll see um, the name of my container is gonna be ghost container. The image is ghost. So the image is the image from Docker Hub. I'm pulling that directly from Docker Hub. My port is gonna be 2368. I'm also gonna create a service, which I don't wanna get into in this video, but this is gonna expose my application to a public IP address. Now there's also uh, an, an imperative approach to Kubernetes where you can declare stuff on the command line directly, but most people will create a file like this. As I said before, we interact with Kubernetes via the kubectl CLI. So I can open up my terminal here and I can say kubectl and gives me all kinds of options. Now, since I created a file called ghostdeployment.yaml, I can just come down here and do kubectl create and then dash f for file in ghost deployment.yaml 
And when I hit return, it should then take this information and deploy this application to my Minikube cluster based on the information that I'm gonna give it. So hit return. You'll see it says deployment created, service created. Now I can say kubectl, get pods. This is gonna give me information on my pods. And you see I have three of them and they're all three running already. I've already pulled this image, I have it locally, so they're running already. So this kubectl is a way that I'm interacting with the API server. I can do things like kubectl describe pods and this will give me way more information. So I can find out all kind of information about my pods. I can say uh, kubectl uh, get service and this will tell me about my service. So I have a ghost service that I deployed. It's a load balancer. So I want to load balance these three pods. Here's my cluster IP, which is my internal IP and my external IP is pending. Why is it pending? Well, when it comes to load balancers, whatever platform you're using will have its own type of load balancer. So if you have, so if you're on AWS, they have a type of load balancer. Azure has a type of load balancer. If you go to DigitalOcean, they have a load balancer you can use. Well, Minikube doesn't have one. So it's gonna stay pending because they don't have a load balancer. Thankfully, they have a workaround and you don't have to worry about this, but I'm just gonna open up another shell and I'm gonna say Minikube, whoops, Minikube tunnel. This is gonna allow me to create that load balancer or implement a load balancer somehow. I don't know how it works, but anyway, you use this Minikube tunnel and then it gives you an IP address. <clears throat> so I can go back to my other terminal here and I can say the same thing, kubectl get service, and it'll now tell me, hey, you have an external IP. So I can go to this IP, I can open up my browser, put that in and put in 2368, I believe it was, as my port, hit enter, and I should have my application. There it is. There's the ghost CMS being load balanced over three copies or pods. Great, so I got an application load balanced across three pods. So you may be like, hey, what's the big deal? Okay, so we got some applications running behind a load balancer. What's the big benefit here? Well, check this out. I have three copies of my application running, right? So I'll go kubectl, get pods. I got three copies running. Well, hey, let's say again, Tiger Woods is in the lead at the Masters on a Sunday and you know, hey, we're gonna have triple the traffic today. We need to scale this thing up. Well, all you gotta do is say kubectl, scale, and it's a, I sent out a deployment called ghost deployment. And I want replicas, let's say, instead of three, I want six today. So I can say equals six, hit enter. Oh, I gotta put two dashes before the replicas. Two dashes, hit enter, and it says, Ghost deployment scaled. Now let's do this get pods. Now look at that, I got six pods running behind a load balancer. Within seconds, I can spin up three more pods. Oh, it gets out of control again? Well, let me spin up three more. Or, hey, it wasn't as busy as I thought, let me scale it back down to three. So that's scalability. Another big benefit to Kubernetes is high availability. So I got six copies running here, that's great. But what happens if four of them crash? Right, let's, let's kill one of these pods here. So let's choose this pod here that ends in TM. Uh, kubectl delete pod, and let's delete this one. Remember, I got six pods here. Let's say this one crashes. And I'm deleting, if it crashes, it's gonna be instant, but I'm trying to show you here what's going on. So this one ended in RHKTM. All right, that's deleted. Let's get pods again. Boom, a brand new one is spun in its place. What's happening here is, Kubernetes, you've declared this state, like I want it to be three pods and then we scaled it up to six. So it's Kubernetes job to maintain that state at all odds. It knows it has to have six pods no matter what. So if four of them die, it's gonna say, wait, we only have two and it's gonna spin up four more immediately. That's high availability. Your pods crashes, Kubernetes self heals basically. Now the last thing I wanna tell you is just a little cheat. There's a program called Lens, and it gives you kind of a dashboard for Kubernetes. And I wanna just show you this because it, it might help you understand it better also. So I'm gonna choose Minikube. 
And it gives you really easy control over your cluster. And you don't want to do this at first because you want to learn kubectl. You want to learn how to interact in those commands. But then later on, make sure you check this out. So if you look at nodes, I just have the mini cube, which is the master. Remember I told you we just have the master. If you look at pods, there's a bunch of system pods. You'll see with the namespace cube system. And then my six application pods. Now, if you want to look at services, there's services. You see my ghost service, my public external IP. But let me go back to pods and show you here. So let me, let me kill a pod here and you can see what's happening. So let me remove this one. Remove pod, yes. And you'll see that it changes to terminating. Once it says terminating, another one pops up and says container creating, basically. And see, that one just disappeared. The one that crashed just disappeared. Let me grab another one. As soon as I hit remove, you're going to have terminating and then another one pop up immediately. See that? Container creating. So that's high availability, and that's awesome in my opinion. So I hope that was a good overview of Kubernetes. It was very basic, but I hope it helped you understand at least a high overview of the system. All right, so the final thing I want to talk about in this video is how you can learn Kubernetes in 2020. It's really only two steps to learn Kubernetes in 2020. Number one, make sure you're comfortable with containers and more specifically Docker. You can't use a container orchestration system without understanding containers. Now again, if you're not familiar with them or you need a refresher on containers or Docker, I just created a Docker tutorial a couple of weeks ago. It's one hour long. It'll go from explaining what containers are to creating Docker files, to building and running Docker files, even deploying to Docker Hub and to DigitalOcean. In that video, we use a React app we containerize and deploy a React app and a WordPress app, and we even use Docker Compose. So make sure you check that out. Go make a cup of coffee, kick back, and watch that video. Number two, and this is very simple, there's only one course you have to take to learn Kubernetes. Don't take any others, just take this one. Go to udemy.com and type in Certified Kubernetes Administrator. It's by a guy named Mumshot, I forgot his last name. He's with CodeCloud. Anyway, what makes this course special, and I'll put a link to it below, but what makes this course special is after every concept that you learn, you go to their playground where you get quizzed on these concepts. And the unique thing about it is that you are quizzed using a Kubernetes cluster. So he'll say something like, how many pods are running on the cluster? Expose a service on the cluster. That kind of thing. So you're directly working with Kubernetes. Every time you learn a new concept, you got a quiz to take. Now I'm almost done with this course and it's been phenomenal. I've looked at other courses, but nothing really goes in depth like this. So if you want to learn Kubernetes in 2020, this is the one course to take. I can't recommend it enough. He's my new favorite teacher, to be honest. Now that I'm getting heavy into DevOps, this guy has a lot of great courses. I can't recommend him enough. So that's it. That's all I got for today. I hope you feel a little bit better about Kubernetes or you have a better path moving forward. So anyway, again, if you're into this kind of stuff, look for more videos coming. Be sure to subscribe and I'll see you soon.